Welcome everyone to Nutrition and Horses. My name is Jeff Tucker. I'm a veterinarian and this is part of the Horse Talk series of the Horses Advocate, which is a part of the Equine Practice Incorporated. I want to welcome everybody to this webinar. With a brief overview, I want to discuss why I even do this. Why World Wide Web? What is the Horses Advocate? And why talk about nutrition? Well, as I make my rounds from farm to farm in my dentistry practice, I find a lot of people talk to me about nutrition, and they seem to be very confused. Worse yet, they seem to believe the dogma that some of the companies are giving them and other people who are supposedly knowledgeable in nutrition, and they fall short. But nutrition in horses, no matter where you live in this world, is virtually the same. What they have to eat is different, and how they uh, eat and how they work is different, but what they need is all the same and that's what I like to do here that's part of the horse's advocate is to uncomplicate things in a complicated world and that's what this seminar is all about a recording of this webinar will be made available for free to everyone for a limited time and forever to members of the horse's advocate hopefully this is going to flow logically it's going to cover the following topics before I tell you what those topics are I want to give you a warning this will not be what you're used to hearing they built a box that they've been suggested that I start to think outside of. But when they built the box, I was sitting outside of it, and that's where I've always been. So what you're going to hear is going to be a little bit refreshing. I'm going to go over the, the basics of nutrition and why nutrition is an important part of, the, of horse husbandry. I'm going to say why nutrition has become so complicated. I'm going to tell you how to feed your horse, and then I'm going to follow up with some take-home points and questions. So, what is the Horses Advocate? It's a website I put together. It's part of the equine practice, the parent company. And it's there to teach horse owners to become the advocate for their horse living in a human world. And it's to simplify the fundamentals. Because I believe that knowledge is power. And the more knowledge that you have, that you can use, not just store in your brain, but can actually use, will make you a more effective horseman and will help make the horse's life a lot better. And why a worldwide webcast? Because I want to allow a deeper discussion of this subject using a live presentation, allowing for audience questions. And then I want to archive these sites so everybody in the world can see it. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to say right here that this is a recording of the webinar, that the webinar that was recorded somehow got damaged. And so we're not going to have the questions at the end, but I'll be able to cover what was covered in there and be pretty comprehensive. So I'll make sure that all that questions are answered as part of this audio portion of the of this presentation. So I want to help horse owners understand nutrition in the horse by discussing it in a simplified and fundamental way. Keeping it simple will help you understand and will allow you to communicate better with your veterinarian about nutrition in your horses. All right, I've already given you a warning that it's going to be a little different. But it's not going to be so different that you won't be able to understand it. It will shake up some of the beliefs you have and you'll sit there saying I, I never heard it given to me that way before but this is based on a lot of years of experience which I'm going to tell you about in a, in a couple of slides here but I am a veterinarian and I find that most horse owners don't understand nutrition the damage bad nutrition can do to the horse and most importantly how they can improve their horse in every way by feeding it well an educated owner will be able to make the right decisions to become the horse's advocate so that's me i um, been with horses since 1973, and I've been a veterinarian since 1984. Uh, in that 11 years time, I worked full-time with thoroughbreds on a breeding and training farm where I got a lot of my education. And then I went out to Cornell University in upstate New York, and I finished my undergraduate degree and moved right on into their veterinary program, graduating in 84. I've owned many, many horses and witnessed to many changes that we, in the way that we feed them. I'm also a storyteller and a photographer. So these are all my pictures. And um, some of the stories I put in here are true. <clears throat> so what I'll talk about here is probably not what you're expecting. But without nutrition, horses die. It's as simple as that. And with poor or improper nutrition, horses don't thrive, which is more common. Obesity, disease, lameness, behavioral issues, and poor performance can all be linked back to poor nutrition. And it's really important to understand that a lot of the behavioral issues that we work with with our horses can be resolved with just nutritional changes. And I'll go over that a lot later on in this presentation. 
But let me start off with a body condition score. These two horses are in my practice and they're pretty big. Um, but the body condition score is something that we talk about to evaluate how fat the horse is. And a lot of people, most people don't have scales on the farm, so they can't actually sit there uh, and weigh their horse. But every one of us that stepped on a, a scale at home knows that what our weight is. But there's also another measurement called uh, the body fat. And those bodybuilders that you see with the six pack abs and the bulging muscles have a low body fat score. And this body condition score kind of helps with that. There's also something called the top line evaluation score, which is presented by Neutrina at the AAP conference that I just attended out in uh, Las Vegas in 2015. And I thought that was fascinating because it took, takes a look at the top line, which represents the protein or the muscles of the horse. And they said that there's a combination between the body condition score, BCS, and the top line evaluation score, the TES. And I'm gonna get into that. I'm also gonna review uh, gut inflammation, which is so critical in the behavior and the well-being of your horse. So we're gonna look at the body condition score, the BCS. It goes from scale one to nine. One is on death's doorstep, nine is so fat, they can float like a fishing bob if they're thrown in a pond. So let me ask you this. What issues occur when your horse is a body condition score of seven, eight, or nine? I'm pausing here because a lot of you are thinking, and I'll give you the answers. Uh, laminitis, lameness, uh, metabolic disease, insulin resistance, um, and a whole myriad of other diseases that we look at uh, usually in, in fatter horses. So let me ask you the same question. What issues occur in your horse that's a five or even a four? Now these are, on a scale one to nine, five is ideal, it's right in the middle. And four is certainly lean or athletic. And I know that when we watch our athletes on the television and look at them without their shirts on, we're all a little jealous, a little envious, male or female, of the condition of their bodies. But are they fat? No, they're not. True athletes are a five or a four. And yet we ask our horses to be a seven and be, still be athletic, and it just doesn't work. And I've got a, a, an equation I'm gonna share with you in two seconds here that's gonna bring that point home. But let me ask you this though, where do us vets make their money? Is it on the fives or the fours? No way. They're hardly ever lame. They certainly don't have metabolic disease. They usually don't have any other problems, including skin conditions, although they can, but most of those conditions that we see that we spend our money on are on the seven, eights, and nines. In fact, those two horses whose rear ends you looked at have plenty of veterinary uh, problems. And one of those, in fact, is so severely lame as a foal and as a yearling that um, hopefully I'm not speaking out of line for the owner, but uh, the horse isn't gonna last much longer and, and will probably be dead by seven years of age. All right, <clears throat> force equals mass times acceleration, or F equals MA. This is such a cool law of physics. Now, if you don't understand physics or you don't think that you can be a physicist, let me put it in the farrier's anvil story. All right, I'm holding in my hand a farrier's anvil. They weigh between 50 and 125 pounds. So let's just round it off, nice even number, 100 pounds. And I'm gonna pick up this 100 pound anvil and I'm gonna slowly bring it down so it's resting on your toe. And now you've got a shoe on, you got your paddock boots, or your cowboy boots or your sneaker, and, and you're standing there and I slowly just let it rest on your toe. Now, how does that feel? You can feel it for certain. It doesn't hurt, but it's not comfortable, but it's 100 pounds, so it's sitting on your toe. Now I ask you, a lot of you horse owners out there jump your horses. And even if you don't jump them, you ask them to move in a way that they can sometimes maybe step off a little ledge or uh, maybe they barrel race or some other thing uh, where the horse is asked to lift themselves up and come down a certain distance, let's say two feet. So I'm gonna lift this fairs anvil up two feet and I'm gonna let go of it and let it fall on your foot. I'll bet you there's not one person who's gonna let me do that. I'll bet you every one of them is gonna move your toe out of the way as it falls two feet to the ground. That's what force equals mass times acceleration. 
For when the mass is just staying there stationary and held in place, the only thing that's pulling it down is the force of gravity. But when you take a mass and lift it up where the force of gravity can accelerate that weight so it's moving faster and faster, kind of like when you get on an entrance ramp to an interstate and you put your foot to the uh, accelerator and you put it all the way down, your car slowly accelerates faster and faster and faster so the velocity increases but the rate of acceleration is the same and that's what um, that's exactly what uh, the um, gravity is and if you drop it from 2 feet versus 20 feet versus 200 feet the force is going to be the mass which doesn't change times acceleration which is what's going to affect the impact and that's why a 100 pound anvil dropping 2 feet is going to land on your foot and hurt you break it and make you not walk right for a long time Yet, we want to add 100 pounds extra to a horse? I don't understand the concept. It's not, it just doesn't make sense to put 100 pounds on a farrier's anvil on your toe. Yet, 100 pounds is 100 pounds. I don't care if it's chicken feathers or solid steel, it's still 100 pounds. And you're going to add this weight, lift it up, and drop it over a fence and put all that weight on the front legs. And then you wonder why your horse is breaking down. That's what extra weight means. It means lameness and breaks, breakdowns. In addition, it screws up the metabolism of the horse. So consider that next time you say, oh, my horse is down 100 pounds. I need to get 100 extra pounds on them. You're basically saying you're putting a farrier's anvil on their back and you're asking it to break down. So let me ask you this. <clears throat> Why can someone eat a donut at 420 calories and gain weight just by looking at it and another person eat the same donut and not gain any weight? Or, why can you feed one horse 12 pounds of grain a day and remain thin while another horse looks at the feed, feed room door and becomes fat? Think little Shetland pony. And before I answer this, I want to look at the uh, top line evaluation score, the TES. But think about that. Why does the same donut cause one person to get fat and another person not? So, <clears throat> Neutrina took the top line evaluation score and divided it into A, B, C, and D. A being an ideal top line, B is sunken at the back area at the withers. It's the first to go and the last to return, by the way, as far as uh, condition goes. C is sunken in the back and loin where the saddle sets, and D is sunken in the back loin and croup, which is basically the whole length of the back. And I know you guys have seen this, especially in older horses as they lose their muscle mass. Uh, they have their backbone sticking up. That's all pure muscle loss. Okay, uh, uh, Neutrina is part of Cargill, and um, they had a pretty interesting story. They were looking at the pigs uh, out in the fields in, in their Midwest uh, home, and they couldn't figure out why all the pigs had beautiful top lines and had lean body masses, but they couldn't find a treadmill on the whole place. They couldn't find exercise riders exercising these, these pigs. And so their uh, thought was, that it's not necessarily an exercise program as it is a nutritional program. And most people who are into bodybuilding or into any weight control of humans understands that 80% of conditioning is proper nutrition and 20% <clears throat> is actually conditioning, getting the muscles built up. So what they said was a horse with a BCS of 5 and a TES of A is a fit horse, but a BCS of 5 and a TES of D is in poor condition. Does that make sense? In other words, same body fat, but one doesn't have any muscle mass. And that's a horse that's in poor condition and starving to death. So be sure to include both uh, TES and BCS in assessing your horse for an accurate assessment. Let me talk about gut inflammation. And I'm just going to get back to this reason why a donut causes a horse to become fat or not. So a simple question. When you swallow your food, is it inside of you? <clears throat> and most people say yes. As soon as I close my mouth, chew it, and swallow it, it's inside of me. But it's not really. You've placed it in a tube that's running through your gut. It starts at your mouth and ends at your anus. Now, there's not a little man inside of you that opens up a little door in your gut and says, Hey, I need some potatoes. Reaches in and scoops out potatoes. That doesn't work. You know that if anything that's inside that tube leaks into your body, you'll die. You'll become very sick for sure. So, what happens? There's an act called digestion and that takes these molecules that all food is made up of and breaks it down into the just basic molecules and those molecules are 
a transporter across a solid wall, as solid as the desk in front of you or table in front of you, or you sticking your finger on one side of your arm expecting to come out the other side, it's not going to happen. You have to break it down into small pieces and get it absorbed on the other side. So whatever you feed your horse, it's like a splinter in your skin and your gut has to decide, is this something good or is this something bad? And unfortunately, <clears throat> grain is inflammatory. And the hindgut, which is <clears throat> behind the stomach, behind the small intestine, it's the basis of what horses use to digest food. It's filled with trillions of bacteria. And that bacteria takes this food and breaks it down into little pieces. And it takes those pieces and sends it across the gut wall <clears throat> and is used for inflammation. So it's a two-step process. If you think of it this way, when you eat, you're actually feeding the bacteria in your gut. That's what you're doing. And if your bacteria demands certain things like sugar, you're going to put more sugar in your body to feed them. And they're happy, but it's not helping your, your body at all. But if you change <clears throat> the bacteria in, or change the food that you feed, it'll change the bacteria in the gut. And those bacteria will actually produce good foods that allow your horse to have abundant energy and you abundant energy and clear thinking and longevity. And that's the whole idea behind nutrition. Feed what the gut is supposed to eat and you won't have this high gut inflammation. But <clears throat> one of the biggest side effects is uh, difficulty uh, behaving. Uh, from unwilling to be brushed to bucking until you fall off and dozens of other signs. For instance, unwilling to be brushed. If you brush your horse and he pins his ears and looks back at you, he probably has high gut inflammation. Girthiness as you tighten up the gut because a large colon actually comes all the way forward to just behind the elbows and that's where you put in your girth and when you tighten it up it squeezes that um, area. <coughs> An unwillingness to load or be trailered. Think about this. Every time you put a horse in the trailer and then you send it down the road, <clears throat> it starts bouncing up and down on the, on the surface. And that leads to gut inflammation being inflamed and, and hurting or just not feeling good. And, and who wants to get in something when you don't feel good? Any one of you who doesn't like to f get on a plane because of the way you feel isn't going to get on the plane. You aren't going to like to fly, not because it's going to fall out of the sky because that doesn't happen that, that often, but just because you don't feel good. And that's what these horses feel like when you load them and trailer them. So before you spend a lot of money trying to teach a horse how to load on a trailer, why don't you change his nutrition? And so then he doesn't associate feeling bad with riding on a trailer. Same with unwanted riding behavior. As you ask the horse to jog down the road or on the, in the arena, uh, all the, the gut becomes inflamed and just doesn't feel good. So they lead to, uh, it goes to unwillingness to move, balking, uh, bucking, uh, crow hopping, and basically running back to the, the barn because that's where they know they can rest in peace, if you will. Anytime your horse defecates and there's a little bit of water that comes out with it, what I call the squirts, that's usually hind gut uh, inflammation. Anytime you find little chunks of grain in there, that's your hind gut not digesting the food. Uneasiness, fidgety, doesn't like change, distant, unhappy, unwilling, stubborn, difficult for the farrier, and frankly, dangerous attacks on the human. Um, these are all signs of hind gut inflammation, and it's so simple to take care of. <clears throat> so uh, can nutrition help uh, hard keepers and obese horses? Yes. Can a horse live without grain? What should a horse eat? Well, that's all to come. And yes, they can live without grain. But in the meantime, I want you to consider taking the two-week no-grain challenge. That's where your horse only eats hay, grass, water, and salt. And in those four things, I never said carrots, sugar cubes, treats, apples, or anything, including supplements, because most supplements have grain in it. Just for two weeks, only feed hay, water, salt, and pasture. And that's it. And see what happens. Document it every day. Write down everything that your horse is doing wrong. And over a two-week period, write down any changes. And then send those um, that diary to me. I'd love to post it on my website to show people that taking your horse off grain really makes a difference. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> why has horse nutrition become so complicated? Well, it's a business model of creating a new market to deal with a grain surplus. We've become so efficient at farming that we now produce 
thousands of thousands, tens of thousands of pounds of extra grain uh, for our breads, our cupcakes, uh, our dog food, our horse food. We have so much extra grain that in fact, 1.2 Americans can feed a thousand of us. That's how efficient our farming's become. Back 100, 200 years ago, one family farmed everything they needed and usually didn't have any surplus. And if they did, they stored it so they could survive over the winter. And that's how we ate. Now we can go to the grocery store and get anything we want, any fast food chain place, uh, any donut shop. We can get all the grain that we want. And we're now having an obesity problem in our, in our society. And the same thing with the uh, horses. We're getting a uh, obesity problem in horses with all the subsequent um, uh, medical issues that go along with it. But the problem is the grain companies didn't want to um, throw the grain out. They didn't want to tell the farmers to stop farming. And it's expensive to put on container ships and ship it to other countries that don't have any grain. So what they decided to do was find new markets. And that's what you and I have become, a new market for these guys. And through great marketing skills, uh, they've convinced almost every current modern horse owner that their horse needs grain. And in reality, they don't. In fact, if you think about it, where does a horse get grain naturally? Is there any place on the planet where a horse can actually find oats or corn available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year, in the middle of winter, they could just run right out and grab a bite of corn or some oats or some wheat. It's just not possible. So just common sense tells you that grain is a supplement that man has made and put together to help a horse get fat. But in reality, it doesn't cause a lot of horses to get fat. In fact, some of these hard keepers where you're feeding four or five, six quarts of grain a day are actually not gaining weight because the inflammation is so great in their hind gut that they consume all their energy just in the inflammatory process and there's nothing left. There's nothing left for these horses to actually build uh, muscle or fat on and they become thinner. They're called heart keepers. That's the person who eats all the donuts and stays skinny. That person has gut inflammation. You don't want that person's gut inflammation. You want to change the diet and lean out everybody and fatten up those that are that can't eat. And believe it or not, some of these hard keepers will actually start to gain weight once you start feeding them like a horse. All right, <clears throat> here's an example of some marketing. Uh, a lot of companies have something called low carb feed. Well, if I offered you a Twinkie, or I offered you half a Twinkie, and I'm sorry Twinkie, I don't mean to pick on you, but it's the first thing that comes to my mind. A cupcake, let's just say, if I offer you half a cupcake, what would happen if to you if you ate only half the cupcake? Well, you'd have half the calories. That's what these low carb feeds are. They're half the calories. So um, the um, what was I thinking? I got distracted. Sorry about that. But <clears throat> the low carb feeds are basically uh, the regular feeds uh, cut in half with uh, some non digestible fiber. And uh, it doesn't really help the horse and you're spending a lot of money. So if you want to cut down the grain, but you don't want to eliminate it, just feed half of it. They'll be fine with just a handful of grain, handful of oats, rather than the whole amount of oats. Senior feeds. Um, it's basically sugar beet pulp. And a lot of people call it beet pulp, but the whole name is called sugar beet pulp. So let's call it by its full name. Hay extenders. These are floor sweepings. These are basically non-digestible fiber to help the horse chew on something and fill their stomach up. Not necessary if you feed them correctly. Supplements. Most of them have grain or grain byproducts such as wheat middlings. And what, be careful of the invisible products like red salt licks. The trace mineral salt licks out there have corn and molasses. And that's just another source of sugar in these guys. <clears throat> So most of these marketing strategies are based on human emotions of love and nurturing. If I would, if I could just make one sign for you, it would be food, and then the equal sign with a slash through, which means does not equal, and then the word love. Food does not equal love. So many of these feeds are based on palatability and not what is good for the horse. They add anise, which is scientifically proven licorice flavor, uh, scientifically proven to be the most uh, light um, what do you call it? Light uh, flavor in horses. <clears throat> a 
but I'm starting to notice the change in both the horse owners desiring good information and some feed companies rising to meet that need. And I got to tell you, I'm impressed. A lot of these feed companies are realizing that hay is more important, fiber is more important, and they're starting to move a little bit away from their grain, although they still offer it because it's such a <clears throat> money-making machine for them. So how do you feed a horse? Well, here's a feed room with feeding charts up on the wall with specific directions on what to feed and how much. And you can see all the storage bins that have the separate, separate supplements that are brought in by a company that puts them into the little individual containers. <clears throat> and uh, there's hoof supplements and there's hair coat supplements and there's muscle supplements, all these supplements. I gotta ask you, how did the horse make it? tens of thousands of years without us. I, I don't know. I'm blown away. These horses should have died ages ago. And thank goodness we're here with all these supplements to keep them alive. Well, I know what you're saying. Don't be a, a wise butt. Uh, you're saying the nutrition isn't in the grasses anymore. They've been overgrazed. We don't have enough pasture for the horses. How are they supposed to get all their vitamins and minerals to keep going? I understand. I hear this all the time. But what we keep forgetting is, if you start supplementing with things that causes hindgut inflammation, they're not going to get these things. Everything that you put in the horse's mouth has to be broken down into a small enough molecule to be transported across the gut wall, then reassembled on the other side. And it's as simple as that. Every time you eat a leaf of lettuce, it doesn't go around into your bloodstream as leaves of lettuce. I have yet to see any doctor take a blood sample out of a person, look at it and say, oh, look, there's your hot dog from last night. It doesn't happen. All right. All they see are blood and blood products. They do not see food. So you know, if you think about it, that everything you put in you or your horse's mouth is broken down and reassembled on the other side as molecules that we can use. Horses are browsers. They eat mostly fiber, which is non-digestible carbohydrate. They, they are also continuous eaters. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but they don't have a gallbladder. A gallbladder is a sac that holds the bile that our liver produces. The bile helps produce or, or helps to digest fats and other foods. And we're mere meal takers. So are cows and sheep and goats and your cat and your dog and almost every other animal that you know that's domesticated has a gallbladder because they take their meal and then they have to take the bile that's been produced all the time and stored in the, in the gallbladder and squirt it into their intestines. The horse is one of the few animals on this planet that doesn't have a gallbladder because the bile is constantly being produced and put into the system because they're supposed to have food in there 24-7. What's really interesting is if you ever have a horse that's sick and stops eating for, uh, for a day, you look at their gum lines or you look at the white of their eye and they'll be yellow. That's the bile that's circulating through their blood that has not been used. It's called jaundice or ictric. And they're not sick from that. They're sick from something else. And once you start feeding, that all goes away. Kind of cool. And of course, they have hypsodont teeth, which means the teeth are very, very long and only a little bit of it shows in the mouth and the rest of them are held in reserve. And over time, they click it out just like the lead inside a mechanical pencil. As you're writing with it and they start to wear out, you click out more lead so you can continue to write. That's what hypsodont teeth are. And there's very few animals out there uh, that you know of that have hypsodont teeth, including yourself, your dog, your cat, and sharks. All right? So that's why a horse's teeth are so different. And by the way, horses in the wild are supposed to lose weight in the winter. So stop freaking out that your horse is losing weight because the daylight's gotten shorter um, and it's cold outside. That's what happens. And as springtime comes and the grasses come, they're supposed to get fatter. It's so fat that come September, you're wondering, oh my gosh, the body condition score of this horse is like an eight. That's okay. It's a normal ebb and flow. All right. <clears throat> How to feed a horse? Well, there's genetics, there's age, purpose, exercise, intensity, and th from that you have to determine their nutritional needs. So a young growing horse who's like a teenager who keeps his head inside the refrigerator and eats everything in sight and never gains a pound. That's typical of a youngster. That's why racehorses are fed so much grain because they're running and they're young and they're growing and they can consume all that and it doesn't seem to be a problem. But as soon as they get off the racetrack, that's when you see all the problems. And that's why a lot of thoroughbreds are considered crazy because those thoroughbreds off the racetrack are now six, seven years old, being fed like they're a three-year-old, and they're wound up. 
that's just grain imbalance or intolerance in the hindgut. Also, as they get older or if you have them working harder, if they're pulling the Pony Express or, or plowing fields, uh, they'll need more energy. They'll just run out of steam. So you have to supplement. In fact, that's where grain first came about, giving them en extra energy for all the hard work that they were doing. But most of our horses sit in a stall or hang out in a paddock and they don't exercise a lot. They exercise maybe for 45 minutes to an hour and then they're put away. And I'll admit that's good for toning up the muscles, but they're not being used where they need the grain. They're getting everything they need from hay and grass. So that's how you determine their nutritional needs. Uh, you have to look at each one as an individual. <clears throat> So as far as genetics go, there's growth potential. Obviously, a mini doesn't need as much as a draft horse. You also have to look at their muscle formation. A good quarter horse, a solid quarter horse, is going to be different than a lean um, uh, national show horse or saddlebred. Uh, the types of muscle, whether they're fast twitch, slow twitch, or mixed fibers. This is really important because fast twitch fibers are used for sprinters, those that go really fast. But the slow twitch fibers, which is the dark meat of the chicken versus fast twitch, which is the white meat of the chicken, the slow twitch are the powerful muscles. They're in the hindquarters. They're used for plowing and pulling, things like that. And most horses have a mix of fibers, and that's all genetically based. And of course, the genetics will also tell you the degree of gut inflammation. That's why some of us can eat that donut, and other ones uh, should stay away from that donut. <clears throat> Of course, we have the growing horse, the active adult, and the retired pasture ornament, and all ages require the basics, but it is the consumption of these basic nutrients that vary along with the need to replenish these nutrients. And young horses need growth and replenishment, active adults need replenishment, and retired horses need all the basics at a minimum level. So let's take a look at protein, because this is one of the three major groups. Proteins are made of amino acids. There are 10 essential amino acids. The lack of one now this is really important. The lack of one essential amino acid will limit the absorption of all the others. So let's say the essential amino acid is available at less than 100%, just one of them. All the other amino acids, no matter what level they're giving, will only be partially available. So if you had like 300% of almost all of them, but only 50% of one of the essential amino acids, all the essential amino acids would be absorbed at only 50%. It's a really freaky thing, but that's just the way it's set up. So I want to go into these amino acids and especially the essential amino acids um, because that's really critical for muscle formation. Okay, lysine is the most important for growth and maintenance of growth. So we all need lysine. Without lysine, we stop growing. Now, methionine and threonine are required for the integument, meaning the skin and the hair color. Uh, pardon me, hair and the hoof. Without methionine and uh, specifically DL methionine and threonine, uh, you're not going to have a good uh, hoof. Leucine, isoleucine, and valine are what's called the branch chain amino acid, and these are required for muscle recovery. Without these three, you're never going to have any muscle formation. Uh, it'll just start wasting weight, such as in old horses. And the last group is the phenylalanine tryptophan, histidine, and arginine, and they're the remaining essential amino acids, and I can't get much information about why they're important, but without them, the others don't work. So you need all 10 of these um, amino acids. I think in humans, there's only nine. Um, I think arginine, I can't remember, uh, may not be an essential one, but, um, and tryptophan, of course, is the one that puts you to sleep after a big turkey dinner, but they're all important. So all proteins consumed need to be broken down into the amino acids and then reassembled on the other side of the gut wall. That's why these are called essential amino acids because we cannot manufacture them. The other remaining 10 or so amino acids that build up, make a protein can be made up by molecules of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. They can be assembled, but the essential amino acids we cannot assemble. We have to consume them. And that's why we all, I mean, everything from bacteria to fish to animals to plants even, have to consume food. That's where we get our essential amino acids. Now, proteins attached to fiber uh, needs to be digested in the hindgut where the amino acids are poorly absorbed. Proteins not attached to fiber are readily absorbed in the foregut or the small intestine. 
that's really critical because if you feed a supplemental protein, it's you don't need to feed as much because it's going to be absorbed in the small intestine. Whereas you feed a um, hay or grass that is high in um, amino acids, uh, they're not going to be absorbed until the hindgut, and that's why they need to eat constantly just to get their protein um, amount. So soybean is an excellent source of available protein. It's about 48% protein, but you need to feed about 2.2 pounds of it every day to give the requirement of lysine. And without lysine, remember, if you're not hitting 100% of lysine, all the rest will be under um, utilized as well. So soybean is really good. I've had a lot of clients say, oh, I don't want to feed soybean meal. It causes feminization, and there's so much genetic modification, and I don't want to do that. Well, I understand that. And this is getting back to the argument, do horses get enough protein in the foods that they're consuming, in the hay that they get, or in the grasses that they have? And I agree. I don't think they're getting enough out there, uh, especially the horses here in South Florida that don't have really good grass. The hay is extremely expensive, and so they're not being fed as much hay as they should. So supplementing with a soybean meal source is really good and will help these guys. Pure soybean meal is the best. It also comes mixed with other things, um, and I'd be very careful. Read the back of the package because these 48% protein things also have wheat middlings and other uh, sugars in them, and we want to stay away from that. Another source of protein is whey protein. Neutrina loves this, and they have a nice supplement that has 78% protein and requires only one pound of it uh, to get the daily lysine requirement. So you don't have to feed as much. Whey protein is a byproduct of the cheese industry and milk industry. Um, and it's something I personally am taking now uh, because I want to make sure I have a, as much protein as I need to do the work that I've got and keep uh, my health, um, health active as I hit uh, 100 years of age. So I like to keep my protein up and I choose whey protein. It's cheap, it's available, um, and it can be added to foods and drinks, even coffee. So remember, if the daily lysine requirement is not met, then all the other amino acids, essential amino acids, will not be fully absorbed even if given in excess. For growth horses, the daily requirement of lysine is needed for the young horse to meet its genetic potential. For active horses, the branch chain amino acids are required for muscle building and replenishment. These should be fed within 45 minutes of working out to maximize their ability to replenish the muscles damaged. And for retired horses, maintaining the integument is important to prevent them from falling apart. So protein is essential for everybody as far as I'm concerned. So pay particular attention to it. And if you want your horse to start looking better, stop feeding it extra grain and start feeding it either soybean meal or uh, whey protein. Now, how to feed a horse in fat. And some fats are inflammatory, but some are anti-inflammatory. And basically, sat uh, saturated fat is anti-inflammatory, and polyunsaturated fats, like corn oil, are inflammatory. A lot of people are getting on this omega-3 fatty acids. Um, they can come from all sources, uh, but I have yet to see a horse naturally eat fish, but um, it's possible. And fish oil stinks, and a lot of horses won't even eat it. So just be careful of that. Um, that's my dog in the background. Don't worry about it. Mom's home, so he's barking away. But if you want to start feeding uh, some fat to your horse, stop feeding corn oil and vegetable oil. It's inflammatory and doesn't help the horse. If you want to feed something that's anti-inflammatory, go to something that's mixed with coconut. And I like, um, um, let's see, coconut milk. Uh, it's made by Cool Stance. I really like the product. Uh, they also mix Cool Stance, another product called Renew Gold that has coconut meal plus flaxseed. Flaxseed, mechanically cracked, provides anti-inflammatory fat. And all you need to do is feed one pound of this uh, to give the calories needed to supplement a horse not getting enough from the nutrients of fiber. So, in other words, make sure they have soybean meal or whey protein. Make sure they have some uh, coconut meal. And again, I don't know too many horses that are out there eating soybean meals or coconut meals, but these are for horses that you think need extra uh, nutrition that are not making it on just grass and the hay that you're giving them that don't look right. These are the places you start. The last place you want to go to is to grain. 
So just remember, grain is sugar, which is carbohydrates, and they're soluble carbohydrates, which are simple sugars that are found in the grain in the starch part of grass, the non-structural carbohydrates. And the non-soluble carbohydrates are the fiber found in the grass and the hay that forms the structure and are called structural carbohydrates. Sugar is required for survival, but is the source of sugar that is important. So if you feed hay and grass, it's gonna have both soluble and non-soluble uh, sugar, also known as structural and non-structural carbohydrates. And that's what keeps the horse going. We all need sugar, don't deny that. It's important, but if you give simple sugar in the form of grain, like the candy bar, it's not gonna help, it's gonna cause inflammation and it's not gonna put on the muscle that you're looking for. Only protein will do that. And if you want your horse to have the energy and remain calm and, and prolong having that energy throughout the day, think of a fat source. Fat sources are a great source of energy for both humans and horses. And coconut meal is a good way to get that fat source in there. <clears throat> Try to feed as much structural carbohydrates to every horse. Remember, they are continuous eaters, and the guts are, are filled with those trillions of bacteria that just love uh, to break that fiber down. Remember, the horse can't break it down, but the, the guts, the uh, bacteria in the gut, can break it down. And the breakdown of the structural carbohydrate is what we can use for energy in the horse, and that's what they do. Horses with fast switch muscle fibers like quarter horses and sprinters need more soluble carbohydrates for their quick bursts of speed. So keep that in mind when you have a slow twitch fiber such as an Arab or an endurance horse that needs little soluble sugar and requires more long-term sources of energy such as fat and protein. Mixed fiber horses like the warm blood, the thoroughbred, and the trail horse should get only the minimal amount of soluble carbohydrates as necessary to keep themselves going. And they can all get that straight from the fiber that they eat, the grass and the hay. All right, <clears throat> we're almost getting done here. Um, we've got a few more slides to go and we're gonna get down into the electrolytes. Uh, they basically include sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. That's what N, A, K, C, A, and G mean. They require a molecule of sugar to be absorbed, which I find fascinating. And horses given electrolytes within 45 minutes of a workout will recover within 45 minutes to their normal uh, basal metabolism rate versus 12 hours when not given during the cool out period. So it's really important if you've got horses that are breathing hard and sweating hard to give them their uh, electrolytes within 45 minutes of a workout. And horses prefer electrolytes during periods of stress, such as workout trailing or heat. But prefer, but prefer pure water during the night, cool periods, or no stress. So if you offer a horse both, both electrolytes and pure water, you'll find that the horse will drink electrolytes as they're sweating or when they're stressed, and will ignore them and just go for the water at night and cool periods. And electrolytes are not necessary if the horse is not sweating. It's as simple as that. It's only with those horses that are sweating abundantly that you need to replenish the electrolytes. <clears throat> uh, horse supplements. All things that are enter, enter the GI tract needs to be broken down to molecules. How many times have you heard that before? Anyway, this is especially true for the proteins that are included in joint supplements. So if you're feeding a, a supplement that is for the joints, just remember that no matter what brand name they've got and what fancy words they have on the outside, they're going to be broken down into the basic uh, components and built up on the other side. Most of the bodies made for of uh, saturated fat, including the skin and the sheath of the nerves. Feeding saturated fats is well liked by the body because it can be reassembled and used on the other side. So consider using more saturated fats than unsaturated fats. It'll help the skin and the sheath of, of, of the nerves. And many supplements are not regulated. Those that are regulated still need to be reassembled. So what are you really feeding? So let me just repeat that. A lot of the supplements that are out there, if they're not regulated, if they're not looked at by an independent company for quantity, uh, then what you're feeding, what you've got in that jar may not be what's on the label. And some independent studies have done this, analyzed what's in the supplements and found that it went from zero of the active ingredient to a thousand times the active ingredient and it put a lot of doubt into what you're actually getting for supplements. So if you get a supplement, uh, make sure it's uh, been independently tested, comes from a reliable manufacturing process, 
and still be uh, uh, aware that everything you put in the horse has to be broken down into molecules and reabsorbed on the other side. All right. <clears throat> I'd like you to think about removing all supplements for two weeks. Um, just adjust the basic nutritional needs of the horse and allow the gut to stabilize. The gut takes about four to six weeks for it to completely heal. I'd say more towards six weeks to completely heal from whatever inflammation may be going on there. But if you do decide to change things, you'll definitely see a difference between three days and 14 days. And you have to let things go 14 days before you make a determination if something's working. So remove everything except grass, Pat, um, hay, water, and rock salt or uh, the Himalayan salt or something that's pure salt. Those are the four things you want to be feeding. And after two weeks, when things have started to stabilize and you feel like your horse needs a supplement, add the supplement and only one supplement and let it take effect over two weeks and record your observations. If the results are only positive, then keep it and then add another supplement. But if the results have any negative effects, stop feeding that supplement. All right, let's take a look at some of these uh, take-home messages. Take the two-week no-grain challenge. Allow the gut to heal and stabilize. Add strategic nutrition in the form of amino acids, fats, and electrolytes. Be honest in your horse's needs. Remember, feeding is not love. If you're honest, and you really want to respect your horse and get respect from your horse then start treating him like a horse and feed him like a horse and you will be absolutely amazed on how well they do and stop believing the myths of nutrition that you hear from all sources from marketing to your local um, know-it-all to even your veterinarian and especially the um, nutritionists that are being paid by a certain uh, company uh, most of them are just honest, hardworking people, but they still have an agenda to, to sell what they've got. And you have to take it all with, sorry for the pun, a grain of salt. So go ahead and feed your horse like a horse. And remember, food does not equal love. So this is the point I took questions from the audience. And I think I've addressed most of the questions in here. But if you have any questions, just write them in the comments below here. And I'll try and get back to you as quickly as possible. In the meantime, I'd like you to think about going to thehorsesadvocate.com and click on memberships. The, um, you'll see the simple discussion of the topics on horse care. There's a whole free uh, tour that I put you through. Uh, I have monthly and annual memberships that are available. And you'll also have access to a private Facebook group where you can ask me questions about any horse subject. So go to thehorsesadvocate.com today. And thanks for your time and becoming a horse's advocate. This is Doc T. And I'm wishing you a great uh, rest of your day.